If you've been attending here for some time, you know by now that it's my practice to take a message or to t- take a break from our verse-by-verse study on a particular book of the Bible. In our case, we've been in the book, uh, the Gospel of Matthew now for a couple of years and uh, preach a message from a mother, not two mothers. I don't, don't do that. I don't target specific people in, in the sermon. But we're going to learn from a mother to all of us, fathers included. So I promise you that I'll not be that pastor who will affirm and encourage mothers on Mother's Day and then guilt trip fathers on Father's Day. <laughs> That's not what I do. What we're going to do is we're going to learn from Rebecca, the matriarch of the Jews. Uh, we've learned from Hannah before and Sarah and Rachel. Now it's Rebecca's turn. Two of my, uh, the best memoirs I've ever read feature the influence of the author's mothers. Uh, they were not believers in Christ, uh, but their personal struggles uh, in one particular case of abusive husband and the other uh, uh, as a newcomer, uh, struggles of the newcomer in America shaped the life of their children and their readers um, because of their inspiring stories. Now, the heroes of the faith have not only inspiring stories, but inspired, and by that I mean God breathed, like uh, Paul tells Timothy, the Word of God is breathed out by God, inspired by God. So the famous mothers in the Bible accomplish much more than just inspire us. God preserved their stories to not only inform us, but to transform us. Because uh, we're talking about the Word of God here. And as divinely inspired material, these narratives reveal truth about uh, the human condition. Um, We're going to verify that again. uh, Human nature has not changed in over thousands of years. It reveals truth about our sinful world. The world has not changed as far as being a sinful place. Uh, We may be a little more sophisticated now. We know a little more technology now, but we are a sinful world. Uh, There are stories also revealed uh, redemption and the character of God. So, for example, Sarah, Rachel, Hannah, Ruth, Deborah, Mary, and Elizabeth personify virtues in the struggles and resonate with men and women from every generation because we identify with them. We struggle just like them. They are not perfect. They don't always provide the best example for us to follow. I'll give you an example. David, a man after God's own heart, uh, who committed murder and adultery. Now, we shouldn't follow those examples. Um, but the sagas, for example, of the famous moms here uh, are much more relevant than any non-biblical biography. So we're going to survey the life of Rebecca here. We're going to focus on one season of her life. Now, there, otherwise, we'd be here the whole day. And you have plans to go take your moms to lunch today. So we're going to focus on one aspect of the life of Rebecca here. The, mother of I, the, the, the wife of Isaac, the mother of Esau and Jacob, the twins. Her story starts in Genesis 24. But again, we will focus on the betrothal part of her life, right before she got married to Isaac. Okay. Now, I'm going to provide a little bit of background information here. So it's a little different than what we're used to here. Um, So bear with me. We're going to talk about the blessings of God's providence because that's what the life of Rebecca teaches us. We can outline her life in three points, her character, her circumstances, and her choices, but we're going to focus on her character here. Uh, And maybe next year we can talk about her circumstances or in a few weeks, uh, her choices or whatever. So we'll focus on her character now. Like the rest of us, None of the heroes of the faith possess the gift of perfection. Did you know you don't have the gift of perfection? Ask your spouse and you will confirm that. In fact, many of them, many of the heroes of the faith that we are so uh, familiar with, like I said, committed serious lapses of moral, ethics, and common sense. Take Abraham, again, the patriarch, for example, in uh, being okay with taking another wife and thinking that God would use that and bless that uh, to, to, to fulfill his promises of being a nation there. The story of Hagar, um, obviously a lapse in judgment there, a lapse in moral even. Or even Isaac, for example, repeating the same mistake of his father when he, had to lie, when he felt the need to lie about the identity of his wife in order to protect her as if God could not prevent any evil from happening to her. But uh, the predicaments, mistakes, victories, and transformation of the Bible characters here give us hope 
The same God that walked with them thousands of years ago walks with us today, and He has not changed. God doesn't change. He doesn't need to develop like you and I do. We must change. The Bible says we are supposed to change. Not God. He doesn't change. There's no need for that. Uh, he doesn't develop. He doesn't learn anything because He knows all things. He is perfect in everything, in every one of His attributes. So there's nothing to be gained there from God. God doesn't gain anything. But as we study the life of Rebecca, two lessons emerge clearly here from the narrative. We're going to talk about each one of them. The first one is I want you to see that she was an answer to prayer. And right there, because she's an answer to prayer, obviously the encouragement for all of us is for us to be answers to prayer to other people. Now, in case of Rebecca, she was a passive answer to prayer. She doesn't know when she enters the narrative that she is immediately blessing the family of Abraham. Now, the author of the book of Genesis first mentions her in chapter 22, verses 20 to 22, like this, when Abraham heard that his brother gave birth to uh, one, at least one girl. Now it came about after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, uh, Milcah has also borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, and Buz his brother, and Camuel the father of Aram, and Kezed, and Hazel, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel became the father of Rebekah. So that's how she comes into the biblical narrative here. A few decades later, when Isaac was 40 years old, the patriarch decided to arrange his son's marriage. That's Abraham deciding to arrange for the marriage of his son. Now, that is a culturally specific way of doing those things back then. Our culture today doesn't do that, although uh, some cultures within America will do that. And uh, there's an argument there that fathers know better. I, I sign off on that for sure. But um, through uh, we, Abraham, when he learned about Rebekah, he kept that in, in mind because... She was around the same age as uh, Isaac, and Abraham certainly thought about his grandniece when he sent his chief servant on a 450-mile journey to find a, a bride for his son. Okay, and by the way, the fact that uh, Rebekah was Abraham's grandniece means that uh, Rebekah and Isaac were closely related. There was no problem in those days to do that because the Mosaic law prohibiting those unions was uh, centuries after that. Now, the story is that Abraham commissioned his servant, probably Eliezer. That name rings a bell. He is the oldest servant in the house of Abraham. The book of Genesis tells us that. Uh, he commissioned him to go find a, 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 a wife for his son. And we call this type of narrative guidance narrative. And the reason for that, church, is because we hear, what we see here is God doesn't speak audibly to anyone here in this particular case. Now, he does to Abraham, for example, in Genesis 12, when he tells the patriarch to go and leave his family and go to the land that, he, that God would show him. Uh, in the life of Rebekah, she heard the audible voice of God later on in her life, but not so in this particular case. In fact, I would argue that God doesn't speak to us audibly today because He has completed uh, the revelation of His Word. There's no need for Him to do that. But uh, what we have here in Genesis 24 is a guidance narrative where God shows His providence behind the scenes. There are very few mentions of God's uh, title here um, in this particular chapter. In fact, Eliezer is the one who mentions God in prayer, in his prayer. But this is a love story, Genesis 24 here, an inspired by God love story. Uh, and the author includes the details of this betrothal here, commissioning a servant to go fetch a bride for, for, for Isaac because uh, he wants us to know God's providence in the whole process here and, and the care with which Abraham selected a bride for his son. The reason for that, church, is because you will remember there was a promise that God made to Abraham, and the promise was threefold. I will give you land. I will give you a progeny. In other words, you will have many, many children, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed, meaning the, the Messiah would come from the line of Abraham. Now, Abraham knows that, and he knows God a little better now. He's been walking with God for some time. He's 140 years old, old at this time, and he knows better than to find a wife for Isaac in the land of Canaan because that's where he lived at the time. Now, he didn't want a wife from a cursed line. You will remember perhaps in Genesis 9 when Noah cursed the Canaanites. And not only that, but uh, Abraham knew the people around him. He knew that uh, his family probably had heard about the true God, 
uh, the God of covenant, the God that made a promise to Abraham, and he didn't want his son to marry a Canaanite because that would have probably be seen as a political alliance type of a marriage. We know that that was the case in many um, uh, tribes around that time and around Abraham because he mentions such a thing in, uh, by uh, political alliance with, with the kingdom of Sodom who offered him to do that. Now, and furthermore, Abraham seen, had seen and heard the ungodliness of the nations around him. So he said, God knows better. I don't want my family to be involved in any of this. I want my family to uphold the values of God. I want my family, I want to raise my family in this way. I'm raising the son of the promise. So therefore, the ideal suitor for him, my ideal daughter-in-law, will come from uh, the family line. Now again, um, he was 40, 140 years old at this time. This was common back then. People lived longer back then. Not as long as the people before the flood. But the point here is that Abraham wanted to see partially the fulfillment of the promise. He wanted to see his grandkids. And uh, he figured, well, Isaac is not getting any younger. He's 40 years old. It's time for him to get married. So he concluded that the best suitor would come from his close relatives. And this is how Rebekah enters the scene officially. Follow along with me if you have your Bibles. Genesis 24, verses 15 through 21. Before he had finished speaking, right, wait right there, before he had finished speaking. This is talking about the servant of Abraham already at the end of his journey to go find a wife for Isaac. He was praying. That's why I say that Rebecca is an answer to prayer to him and to the patriarchal family. But the narrative tells us that before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man had had relations with her. And she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for you your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw. And she drew for his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. So that's why we call this a guidance narrative here. This will, will prompt this encounter. The servant uh, of Abraham was praying all the way through this journey. He had promised Abraham to go and find a wife for Isaac in the land of his brother Nahor. And Abraham made him promise, don't, take, don't even take my son with you because I don't want him to get distracted on the way. You know, that maybe he'll go through some lands there. That he'll, he'll decide to find a wife there. And we don't want that. So um, the servant arrived just outside the city. Um, and uh, they waited. The, the, the servant and the entourage there waited strategically for the time the woman would draw water from the well. Perhaps Abraham told him that's the custom of that. The women will go and draw water from the well. Uh, so the faithful servant prayed specifically for guidance. What a great thing to do. He prayed, Lord, will you guide my way? Um, this is a, a life-changing experience for everyone in this family. Sarah is just dead. That's, uh, the, chronology, the chronology of the story here is that Sarah died not, not, uh, very, uh, not, not too long before this. And then he says, Lord, guide my way. Um, and he expressed a desire for particular character traits in this bride-to-be. One of them was hospitality and generosity. Perhaps he figured, well, if a woman shows up and demonstrates hospitality and generosity, she's on the top of the list. Uh, also, he was looking for health and physical attributes, physical uh, vitality, appropriate for childbearing, because, again, Isaac would be the father of many nations. Uh, and also for the long journey back. Now, write something down here. When the Bible talks about people, the, the heroes of the faith, there very seldomly the Bible refers to any physical attributes. So when the Bible does mention uh, physical beauty, for example, we need to take note of that because later on that's going to be used um, and there's something there for us to learn. And we know that that's the case with Rebecca because she was the looker of the family. Isaac, not so much. But uh, Rebecca was the beauty queen. And Isaac later on was afraid that people will take, will, will kidnap his wife because she was so beautiful. 
And then he followed the same mistake of his father. Because, by the way, Sarah was also beautiful. And so was Rachel, all of the matriarchs. Um, so make note of those physical attributes. For example, Saul was tall, the Bible says, and, and, and handsome. And there's one of the judges there in the Bible who was a little on the overweight side. Now, even humor there that the Bible says when he was killed, the knife was, uh, uh, was, was in there in the fat. Now, um, listen to the prayer of this servant of Abraham here. Because we were saying that Ab uh, Rebecca was the answer to his prayer. Listen to the prayer. Genesis 24, verses 12 through 14. Oh, Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today. And uh, show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink, and who answers, drink, and I will water your camels also, may she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master." Now, this is a very unique prayer, not to be repeated. By the way, we shouldn't pray like this, and I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, this guy is probably not a complete follower of the true God at this point in his life, and we, the reason we know that is because he prays, the God of my master, Abraham. He's not saying, you're my God. He's saying, oh, Lord, the God of my master. Now, he was sympathetic to God, perhaps. He is growing in his faith. He's learning. Maybe we can make an argument at, at the end of the narrative here. He becomes a follower of the God of Abraham. But at this time, he doesn't know how to pray, but he prays. And he's praying for specific uh, hints there and say, well, Lord, may the, the woman who will demonstrate generosity and hospitality to me, may she be the one. Now, I don't recommend you do this because we can be very manipulative in how we pray. For example, we shouldn't pray like this. Lord, if it rains tomorrow in Salem... I will know that I'm supposed to do that. We're manipulating because we know the, 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 the probability of raining here is very high, especially in January, February. I've known people that have done that and say, well, Lord, this is more uh, uh, superstition than anything else. They'll say, Lord, I will take this as a sign. And then we have the, 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 the tendency of manipulating. Now, if we want to learn how to pray, we go to Jesus because he taught his disciples. In fact, the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And then he gives us the model there. But the point I want to make here is that uh, Rebecca was an answer to prayer unknown to her at this time. The servant acted on his specific prayer, asked for water, and, uh, and, and she came and, and, and granted the, the, the prayer. That's why the Bible says he was looking at her, wondering whether or not uh, God had answered his prayer. Now, he reciprocated the generosity and hospitality granted to him by gifting her with gold rings and, and bracelets. Now, this is, again, a culturally appropriate way to, uh, rep to express gratitude for a representative of a wealthy man. Now, the point here is that I can think of several people in my life in particular that are God's answer to my prayers, unknown to them. Several of them are in this room. Um, God used them to demonstrate kindness and generosity and hospitality to me. And maybe you, ha you share the same experience where there are people in your life that God brings at the right time, at the right moment to demonstrate providence to you, to demonstrate kindness, demonstrate generosity and hospitality. For me particularly, one time um, it happened uh, the day I arrived in Salem for the very first time as officially your new pastor. My wife and I, my family and I were praying for guidance, uh, well, the, the, the deal was already done, but we were apprehensive. We were concerned about well, how are they going to receive us? Are they going to tolerate my funny accent? Are they going to like listening to me? Are, is, is my head going to be too shiny for them? And uh, are they going to welcome me and my, and my girls? And unknown to me at the time, some of you contacted our church back in California and asked them what kind of food we liked. And uh, we got home, and it brought tears to our eyes to see that our pantry was filled with the food that we liked. So, so the, the tenderness of that gesture confirmed to us that, yes, God has guided our way all the way from San Diego to here now. And uh, God welcomed us in our church. Another one of those examples was when um, uh, years ago, I couldn't afford to go to Brazil for, to see Denise having our second daughter who did not survive, uh, wasn't going to survive at the time. One uh, fellow seminary student came to me and wrote me a check and said, why don't you get something nice for your wife while you were out there? Um, and I thought, that's very, now he, he knew very little what was going on. 
The following week, he came and wrote me another check for the same amount. Said, get something nice for you. In the third week, I said, uh, anything else for one of uh, my family members that I should get? No, I'm kidding. I didn't say that. I was thankful that he did that because he was God's answer to my prayer at the time. And I know some of you have similar stories. Perhaps you're praying now for God to meet uh, some of your needs. But have you considered the possibility of being like Rebecca to someone, being someone's answer to prayer? You say, Lord, I want to be somebody's answer to prayer, but I don't know what to pray for. I don't know what they're praying for. I want to bless people. I want to be able to come and, 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 and be an encouragement to others, but I don't know exactly what they're praying for. Well, how about you follow the example of this ancient beauty queen here and demonstrate hospitality, demonstrate, demonstrate generosity just like she did. Um, there are several people in the world that need encouragement, that need a, 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 a word of kindness, a word of affirmation. There are several people in our community. If you don't know anybody who can use some encouragement, encouragement see me after the service, and I'll give you a list. In fact, I said that in the first service. And somebody came to me and said, who can I encourage? And I gave her three names of people from our church that can use encouragement, that can use a, a word of, of prayer, that can just say, how can I come alongside you and be an answer to a prayer? How can I provide for you? How can I be a blessing to you? So offer to listen. Commit to pray for him or for her or invite them to coffee. Be an encouragement. Be someone, someone's answer to prayer. But there's a second lesson here that we learn from uh, the life of Rebecca specifically in her betrothal here with Isaac. Not only was she an answer to prayer, she was also an agent of providence, an agent of providence. In other words, God used her to provide for that family, not only uh, food and, and lodging specifically for that man, but comfort and joy to that whole family, as we will see here in a moment. Now, Abraham's servant suspected he might have just met a relative of his master, so he asked her about her family. It was, it was the obvious thing to do. Now, she is demonstrating hospitality, generosity, and kindness to him. Obviously, in his mind, is maybe she's the one. So tell me where you're from. Tell me who you are. And she tells him, and immediately the servant recognized, God's in this thing. God has led me here. He is not only the answer to my prayer, but an agent of God's providence. So in his heart, this short dialogue with Rebecca confirmed God's choice. By the way, infinitely better than our own choice. That's another lesson here for us to learn. When we let God lead the way for every one of our choices and say, Lord, work behind the scenes like you've already behind or you're already ahead of us in this. Um, I, I'm trusting in you for this. So he knew that this guy is learning more about God by the minute here in the narrative. He learns that God provides for him. He's rejoicing now, but he needed one more type of confirmation from Rebecca herself and her family. Because it would not be good to say at that time, uh, listen, I think you should come with me. By the way, that is never a good idea. I met a young man one time who came to me and said, um, Pat, no, no one you know, so don't worry. He said to me, Pastor, I think God is leading me to marry this woman. And he told me the name of the woman that we both knew at the time. And I said, great, I'll be praying for you. He said, no, 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 God has confirmed in my heart that she is the one. I said, well, has God confirmed to her? He said, no. I said, well, I wouldn't recommend you talk to her just yet. He didn't listen to me. He embarrassed himself. He went to her and said, um, God told me I'm supposed to marry you. And he heard the hilarious response. I did not get the same memo. Now, that is not what's going on here. God is uh, leading everyone towards the same goal, as, as we'll see here in a moment. He has so far led this man. And uh, by the way, listen to uh, how he responded when he found out that God is confirming and God is using Rebecca as an agent of providence. Genesis 24, verses 26 through 27. Then the man bowed low and worshiped the Lord. See, he's praying to God. Now he learned how to worship the Lord because God has demonstrated himself to be powerful to him and demonstrated his providence to him. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness um, and his truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. So this guy is uh, learning divine attributes as he walks in, 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 with him here. He's still calling God the God of Abraham, but he says, uh, This is the God who, has, who demonstrates loving kindness. The God who does not forsake anyone. And even and still, he says, as for me, 
He says, personally, God is dealing personally with me. He's not a distant God. He's a personal God. He is guiding me this way. He is leading me. Therefore, I worship him. He learned about God's sovereign uh, choice. Again, infinitely better than our own choice. The God of his master was ahead of him, working providentially behind the scenes to accomplish his purposes. God still does that today. Because it does not change. By the way, there's an entire book of the Bible that has that uh, theme. The book of Esther doesn't mention the name of God once. And still we see God behind the scenes leading everyone, guiding everyone, protecting and all of that. And God does today. He operates by the same methodology because, again, He does not change. Things change. Cultures change. People change. We must change. But God doesn't because in Him there is no variation. Nor shifting shadow, James tells us in James 1, verse 17. So this is how he does these things today. This is how he communicates his uh, providence. Still the same way, he has revealed his plans generally for us. That's in the Bible. So the more you want to know God, the more you should read his word. The more you want to know God's plan for your life. And I hear this all the time. People ask me, I'm not sure what God's plan is for my life. And I say, well, have you read the Bible? Because God is not, he's clear about in general terms, how he wants you to live, or what he wants you to do. Now, as to the specifics, he will guide you providentially when you apply those principles. Um, for example, we know very clearly that if you're a believer in Christ, you're not supposed to be marrying an unbeliever because the Bible is clear about that. So the general principle is there. Uh, who you're going to marry, that's up to you and to her and to the family. I'll give you a couple more examples. Uh, we know for a fact God's uh, principles and God's uh, providence and His design for your life and mine, if we're believers in Christ, every believer must gather in a local church. We know that for a fact. That, that is not debatable because the Bible says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together as is the habit of some. So if you're a believer in Christ, you should be involved in a particular church uh, now, as to what that church will be, that is up, that is between you and God. Now, I'll give you a couple of hints. Not every building that has a steeple is a church. If you see a rainbow flag at the door, run the other way. In fact, uh, if you want to read about the ideal church, the church that Jesus blesses, read Revelation chapters 2 and 3, because that's what uh, Jesus says, this is what I expect from my church. I'll give you a couple more examples. We know that we are called upon to be makers of disciples, disciple makers. And um, people, some people believe that there's such thing as a gift of disciple maker. There is no such thing. Every believer in Christ is called upon to make other disciples of Christ because of the Great Commission passages. That's the general principle there. But as to who you're going to witness to, that is between you and God, God will providentially guide you to the right people. Same thing when Jesus says, I want you to be the light of the world. He says that in, in, in Matthew 5 verse 14 in the Sermon on the Mount. You are a, the light of the world. You are called upon to reflect the light of Christ if you are a believer in Christ. Just like the moon doesn't have natural light but merely reflects the light of the sun, we don't have light in ourselves. We are supposed to reflect the light of the sun as you am. Providentially, he will lead you to a particular community, to a, perhaps for a season, to a particular neighborhood so that you can be light there at that moment. You see, we go from the general to the particular. That's what this guy is doing here. Lord, I, uh, you have made the promise to my master Abraham. Guide me toward the right person. Rebecca immediately knew Abraham's servant was on a mission. Not only because she got all the gifts and all of that, but presumably he had, she had heard of her famous great uncle leaving in, in Hebron and the promise that God had made to him. And on that day, she served as an agent of divine providence, again, not only for food and lodging, but the Lord enlisted her to bring joy to that loyal slave and the patriarchal family. We'll get to that here in a moment. But first of all, I want you to see that God used her to confirm his plans. God used her to confirm his plans for that man. Now, throughout this scene, uh, Abraham's, uh, servant, Abraham's servant addressed the Lord as the Lord of my master, like I said before. But could it be that towards the end, after he concluded that the Lord is loving, that the Lord is kind, that the Lord leads, could it be that at the end of this scene, he said, well, the Lord, the God of Abraham is also my God. And the Lord confirmed his plans through divine providence. Um, 
Here's what happened next. At the dinner table, Abraham's servant told the rest of Rebekah's family the purpose of his trip and the purpose of the meeting and the gifts and all of that because uh, Rebecca invited him to, to the house there. He requested hospitality. She gave hospitality to him. Every, the, the, they met with the two families there, and God confirmed his hope that their young, beautiful daughter and sister was the chosen one for Isaac. Now, the girl's father and brother had the same sense of direction. Again, we see the Lord leading again in God's providence here because everyone in the scene here has the same sense of direction. It would have been a major red flag if the family says, oh, I don't know about that. But we see that the Lord is moving everybody's heart towards the same goal here. God has already prepared their hearts so much that the author of, Hebrew, uh, the author of Genesis says in Genesis 24, verses 50 to 51, then Laban, infamous uh, brother of uh, Rebekah, another study in itself, but Laban and Bethuel replied, the matter comes from the Lord. So they concluded that the matter comes from the Lord. So we cannot speak to you good or bad. Here's Rebekah before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Interestingly here, church, the Lord never spoke a word in this scene here. But they have concluded through divine providence that this is the will of God. Everybody's on the same page, which teaches us a couple of things. First of all, I, teach, I tell this to young families, or young, young people wanting to get married all the time. You want to get married? That's great. I recommend marriage. I've been married for 20 years. It's a great thing. But is everybody on the same page? Are both families on the same page? Is your church on the same page? Is your pastor on the same page? Because if anyone is not on the same page, then use that as a red flag. Perhaps it's time to wait. And the book of Proverbs here reminds us that uh, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. So the Lord um, turns people's heart towards whatever his goal is, and that is exactly what's going on here in this particular scene. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody agrees that the Lord is leading them. But there's one more person that needed verbal confirmation, and that is Rebecca herself. By the way, don't let anybody ever tell you that the Bible puts women down. That is never the case. People who say this never read the Bible because what we have here is Rebecca being asked, do you really want to go with this dude? Is this what you want to do in your life? Because uh, we're supporting you. We know that this is from the Lord, but... We still need to confirm, we need confirmation from you. And here's her answer in Genesis 24, verse 58. Very simple. Yes, I will go. Because, yes, God is in this thing. I'm going to go. I don't know the man. I don't know this Isaac. But I will go. I'm trusting the Lord. Lord knows, the, the, the Lord knows better. I'm trusting in him. I don't trust my own heart. I trust God. He had um, providentially prepared her heart also. So everybody agreed. That the Lord, uh, that, that God's hand was in this matter. Obviously, the only appropriate response was to bless her and submit to God's plan and say, Here, go in peace. And they gave her the patriarchal blessing, uh, which says this in Genesis 24, verse 60 May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. That is a patriarchal blessing, very common during the time uh, of Genesis here. Now, this, these are not very common today. We don't do those uh, in our culture, but we have something similar. And I can think, for example, of uh, the father who agrees to give his daughter uh, to, to be married to, to his son-in-law. Now you're, you're under the authority of that. You, this is your family now. You're under the, the authority of another man now because I am in agreement that this is God's will. I can think of, for example, the church that sends uh, its members to the mission field. There's a common consensus that God is um, sending this person to the mission field. There's usually a board that meets and interviews the candidate to go on the mission field. There's, a, there's an agreement within everybody. I remember in my ordination services, uh, my ordination uh, council, there was an agreement after my grilling for a couple hours. There was an agreement uh, within the members of that, com uh, that, uh, that uh, committee that, yes, God is calling me to, to the ministry there, and therefore we're going to lay hands on him, not lay hands on me like as in discipline, but lay hands on as praying for me. I remember also the day when I called my pastor before coming here to let him know that the people of Grace Baptist Church had voted me in to be their new pastor. There was a common consensus there. Everybody was on the same page. Not, not everybody. There was a 96% vote. 
By the way, if you're part of the 4%, no, I'm kidding. Um, I don't think they're here anymore. <laughs> but the point is, I called my pastor and I said, they voted me in. And he said, well, God's in this thing. I'm not going to stand in the way. I hate to lose you, but you go and be their shepherd. You're going to be a great leader. But if anything happens, you come back, he says. And I'll never forget. There was a consensus about uh, God's direction for my life at that time. And perhaps some of you have similar stories of how you got married, how you landed in this church, how you landed the job here in Salem, uh, of how God used other people to be agents of providence to you. Now, we've got to be careful with this. We've got to, well, so-and-so told me. No, you've got to make sure that, uh, that, that, that you confirm that in, in Scripture, that God leads you providentially. In the case of the matriarch here, God used Rebecca not, o- not only to confirm her plans, but even more gloriously, God enlisted her to comfort his people. She was used of God to bring comfort to a grieving family, and that's how that story ends in a climax here. And that is a beautiful part of this story. Now, Eliezer and his entourage returned to the house of Abraham, okay, at this time. And Isaac saw the convoy from a distance. He, he, he had never seen this, this woman. She was veiled. The Bible says she put a veil on. But bridegroom and bride looked at each other for the first time. And the author of Genesis describes what happened next. Listen carefully. Genesis 24, verses 66 to 67. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother's Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. See, the beautiful part of this is that God used Rebekah to bring comfort to the patriarchal family. This is Sarah, the famous matriarch, the one who conceived in her old age, the one who is a co-heiress of the promise with Abraham. She's a hero of the faith. The book of uh, Hebrews mentions her in the hall of faith there. She is gone. She is dead. Abraham and Isaac, Isaac are thinking, what, what's with this promise thing of, of, of us being a, a great nation? Then God brings Rebecca at the perfect time. In church, what we learn from this is God's timing is perfect. God's timing is better than yours and mine. See, we want things for tomorrow. We pray and I say, Lord, I want this and I want that tomorrow. And here's what I want you to do. And we give God instructions in our prayers. And we don't realize that God says, no, um, perhaps I want to wait because I want you to walk with me. I want you to endure some things. I want you to learn through perseverance whatever God's plan is. But God timing in this particular case, as in all every case, was perfect. She showed up in the patriarchal family while father and son were still mourning the loss of Sarah. And by answering the prayer of that loyal servant, God assured Abraham that his covenantal promises never fail. In church, God's promises to you will never fail. You see, the covenant that God made with Abraham was unconditional. And that's all there in Genesis 12, 13, 14, and all the way to, to, to the end of the narrative of Abraham here. In other words, God told Abraham, no matter what you do, I have decided to bless you. You will mess up. You will blow this thing over and over again. But I am making a promise, not because there's anything good with you, but because I am great. I am loving, and, and I am sovereign. That is God's uh, perspective on the covenant. And you and I are under a similar covenant. The promise that God made to take us to heaven if we come to faith in Jesus Christ. You will never sin your way out of the grace of God. Did you realize that? If you are in Christ, you will never be outside of Christ. God's promises to you will never fail. And God is demonstrating that in the life of Rebecca and Abraham here. It may take a while, but God's promises to you will not fail. And he will use people to comfort you and to remind you from time to time. God's, God remains faithful to you even when you traverse the valley of the shadow of death because that's what these people were experiencing here. They were, death was at their door. They were grieving the loss of their matriarch. They were traversing the valley of the shadow of death and God's demonstrating to them his love and compassion and kindness and his faithfulness in fulfilling his promise. So friend, whether you are grieving the demise of a relationship or shattered, shattered hope, or facing emotional fatigue, or experiencing exhaustion, 
spiritual exhaustion, emotional exhaustion, or the death of a loved one even. He will sustain you because just like he demonstrated to, to, to Isaac and Abraham, he is the God of all comfort. Paul confirms that in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 3. He cares for you, 1 Peter 5 verse 7. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken, Psalm 55 verse 22. Even though he withholds from us what we've been praying for for a long time, perhaps temporarily, perhaps forever, but he cares for you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, Psalm 46 Verse 1, and he demonstrates that in the life of Isaac and Abraham through Rebekah. We are afflicted in every way, just like them. Not, uh, we are um, uh, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about the body, uh, in the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. In other words, we will experience adversity in this life because we live in a fallen world. Between now and uh, in heaven, we will see and experience evil. We will see and experience sorrow and pain and affliction and tribulation and trials. But God's promises to you never fail. He promises to carry you through, sometimes not immediately out, but through your persecution and your affliction. That is exactly what he's doing here. At the right time, Rebecca showed up. But Jesus himself promised to be with you, even to the end of the age, he says in Matthew 28, verse 20. And because of that, church, neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Even delayed hope cannot separate us from the love of God because he is faithful, he will fulfill every one of his promises to you. The problem is when we try to claim promises that God never made to us. For example, he never promised you that you will be wealthy in this life. Did you know that? Abraham was, but that is not prescriptive. It's a descriptive indication of what happened. Then he never promised you that you will never be sick. That, that comes from lousy preaching out there. But that's not what the Bible says. He will always carry you through your trials, and he will bring you comfort at the right time. Now, because of his everlasting love, he may enlist someone to comfort you, usually from the body of Christ. I gave you some examples in my own life, and you have examples in your own life too, but not exclusively. Sometimes he uses even unbelievers uh, to provide and to give comfort to us. And uh, in the case uh, of Rebecca here, she was an instrument of joy and a vessel of blessing and a conduit of comfort to that family. That's who I want to be. And that's how we want to conclude today. I want to be somebody's Rebecca, a conduit of hope, of blessing and comfort. Now, uh, maybe you're asking God to give you hope and comfort and blessing and all of that. Continue to do that by all means, but perhaps consider the fact that maybe God wants to use you to be a channel of blessing and comfort to others just by being you. You don't have to preach a sermon to them. I learned, in fact, in my ministry that the ministry of presence is more important than the ministry of preaching in the time of loss. I don't remember the words that uh, my good friend George Cuff came and told me when my son died, but I remember his tears. I remember that he was there with me and he put his, his hand on my shoulder and embraced me and brought me close and cried with me. So perhaps God wants to use you in the same way so that you can be a comfort to someone. Those of us who experience this type of comfort through his people must perpetuate the process. We're called upon to do that. So come alongside someone today. Find someone who's hurting and put your hand proverbially or literally put your hand on their shoulder and say, Brother, how can I lift you up? How can I tend to your wounds today? Is there something I can do for you? Can I cook a meal? Can I pay a bill? Can I give you a ride? Can I give you a word of encouragement and affirmation? Speaking of encouragement in the life of Rebecca and all of that, I picked up a book this week that I'll probably recommend when I'm done reading here to our library. By the way, if you, if you haven't noticed, we, every month or so I recommend a couple of books for you to read. This book is entitled Encouragement, Adrenaline for the Soul. What a great title. Encouragement, Adrenaline for the Soul. 
This author, Mark Chansky, compares words of encouragement and comfort uh, with the adrenaline of uh, an auto-injector pen that people use sometimes to, uh, people who are hormone deficient use those pens. And he says that uh, whenever you give someone a word of encouragement, a word of comfort, you are functioning like that pen. It gives that person a boost of energy. Maybe that person is down and it just needs to hear that you love them, that you care about them, that you're praying for them. I want to be that kind of a pen. I want to be a conduit of, of, of encouragement, just like Rebecca was for that person. We don't know what he said, what she said to Isaac, but she was just there and, and blessed his heart. I want to be that kind of a person. Not a needle that extracts encouragement. Those, those are, are, are there too. And then there are people who are, unfortunately, like, just like that. They, they're like needles that extract encouragement from people and suck the life just out, right out of you. We don't want to do that. All of us are capable of doing that. And I am painfully aware of my own tendency to be the opposite and inject toxicity in people's lives rather than encouragement. Toxicity in the form of gossips, in the form of put-downs, in the form of disunity, bickering, complaining. Oh, have you been around uh, constant complainers? I, I don't last more than five minutes in, in a conversation with a chronic complainer because before I know it, I'm complaining about my life, my family, whatever. So what we want to be is we want to be just like Rebecca, a conduit of blessing. We want to be someone who brings comfort when you come into the room. You want to be someone who brings uh, encouragement. Now, but let me give you some more words of encouragement in case, well, I, I don't measure up to Rebecca's perfection. Friends, Rebecca is far from being perfect. In fact, you think your family has drama? Read the story of the family of Rebecca. She was not always a conduit of blessing, and she, her life did not always produce comfort. In fact, again, um, she experienced treachery, agony, lying, and all of that later on in life. But in this particular season in her life, she provides a perfect example for us on how we should reproduce her generosity, her hospitality, humility, and loyalty. And today we just focused on her character. There's, there, there are studies to be done on her circumstances and her choices, which we can do possibly next year. I've already been commissioned by Mrs. Rosa to do a study on one of the men of the faith, one of the fathers of the faith. So Father's Day might be coming, and we'll maybe talk about one of the fathers there. By the way, if you, wanna, uh, uh, if you want me to talk about something, go to my wife. <laughs> I'm kidding. You can just talk to me. If you have a question, you wanna, want me to address something from the pulpit, just come and talk to me. Father, thank you um, for the story of Rebecca here and the fact that you teach us so much. Lord, we want to be just like her in this season of her life, faithful, loyal, hospitable, generous, kind, submissive to her family. Lord, and um, we want to we wanna be just like her, an encouragement to other people. We want to bring comfort to others, Lord. What a blessing to be used of you to bring comfort and encouragement to others, Lord. I pray that all of us will have that goal in our lives, Lord. By, by default, we already... Uh, talk toxicity to people, Lord, when we complain, when we gossip, when we assume motives on other people, when we don't give them the benefit of the doubt, Father, that, that is our sinful nature acting up, Lord, and we are painfully aware of that. We want to do the opposite. We want to be a, a conduit and a vessel of blessing to other people, Lord, because you've called us to do that. We're the light of the world. We're the salt of the earth, Lord. So, Father, equip us for that task, we pray, Lord. And once again, we pray for our mothers around us here in this room, mothers represented here, perhaps mothers who are heartbroken because of a bad relationship, Lord. We pray for comfort for them. Since we're talking about comfort, Lord, we pray that today, even, you will bring comfort to them, oh, Lord. Um, we love them. We love you, most of all, because you first loved us. And we pray to you. We praise you. and We want to glorify you in everything we do. In Jesus' name. Amen.